praise your name, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed is your name, Lord Jesus.
Christ the Lord, for he alone is worthy, for he alone is worthy, for you alone are worthy, Christ Jesus the Lord, I love you, Lord, forever, I will love you, Lord, forever, hallelujah. I will love you, Lord, forever, for all that you have done. Hallelujah. Oh, come, let us adore. Oh, come, let Hallelujah. Thank you, Father, for this wonderful goodness. Thank you, Father, for your grace that extends to every place, 
gives everyone a chance to know you. Ah, thank you for this glorious liberty you've given, this freedom from sorrow and oppression. Thank you for this joy from the glory that cannot be seen with the naked eye right now, sometimes, but can be felt from spirits to the soul throughout the body. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father God, for this mighty healing power that is in the name of Jesus Christ. Healing from sin and sickness and disease from every plague of man and that plague of iniquity especially. Father, we thank you for the precious blood of Jesus that has liberated us from the prison of darkness and blindness of heart and mind. That we might know you, Lord Jesus. That we might walk, oh God, in this wonderful, glorious life that you designed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I sing praises to your name, Lord. We sing praises to your name, Lord Jesus. Oh, joyful, joyful, we adore you. You're going to have to change the key. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Well, I would sing some more, but the key's way too high for me. You can be seated. We'll s you can be seated if you can. If you can. I understand. Mm. Joyful, joyful, we adore you. God of glory, Lord of love. Our hearts are yielded now before you. Responding to the Son of us. Now that's not the right key. Oh, joyful, joyful, we adore you. God of glory, Lord of love. Our hearts are yielded now before you. Responding to the Son above. I hope you respond to the Son. Won't you respond <laughs> to the Son above? Father, we ask you in your wonderful mercy and grace, let everybody here experience what amazing love what amazing joy, what amazing peace, what amazing life that only you can bring. Father, thank you for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You know, people find their relationship uh, with another person, especially the first time a guy holds his girlfriend's hand and uh, begins to romantically fall in love with another person and um, you feel some of the best things you've ever felt in your life at that moment. <laughs> and, it's, and, it's, and you may not, you know, you, you may try to define why. You may say, well, she's beautiful or he's handsome or, you know, you may try to qualify it based upon things that they can do. But in reality, you have no idea why on earth you feel so good holding that person's hand. <laughs> you have no idea what, what's going on with you on the inside. Why is it that out of all the people on the earth, suddenly you have this thing going on inside of you over this one individual? Well, see, something happens when you're willing to respond to the Holy Ghost, when you're willing to respond to the living God who draws you to the Lord Jesus and Christ Jesus, the eternal God who 
both lived and died for you begins to hold your hand. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you right now, it is as reproducible, it is, fact, it is more factual and it's more definable than any other living, existing thing on the planet. There's more data points for this than there is for anything else you've observed in your life. There's more, ob there's more reproducible observations for the work of the divine power of the living God. I, that's why we see so many people run to Jesus in foreign countries because they know what it means to live under the yoke of religion. You know, you have all the propaganda that goes on in the West. Are we under the yoke of religion? Well, I'm telling you right now, if you want to bring it down to that when it comes to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the blessings that the Western world has experienced is absolutely unequivocally, it is certainly the result and product of a church on every corner. I know um, one of my friends from the University of Beijing, professor of economics, he was sent by Hu's uh, government in 2000, year 2000, to study the prosperity of the West. And in his statistical report, he had to associate the blessing and prosperity of the West with Christianity because there were no other variables that stood out that made it different from all the rest of the, the world because the rest of the world has the same natural resources. It actually has more manpower. In fact, you could say it has more natural resources. But there was one thing that was unique about the Western world that these other nations didn't have. They had Christ Jesus for their God. And ultimately, this professor of, uh, uh, of Economics University of Beijing, he gave his life to the Lord Jesus. He became a personal friend of mine. Actually has helped serve, with, serve as a, a board member for me in the things that I've done in China. And the Western world is blinded by the propaganda and the lies and the nonsense of people that you've esteemed to know things and they, their, 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 their lives themselves is completely a wreck and messed up. So, you know, if you, want, if you want what's in another person's life and you like their end, just go ahead and follow them. Because more than likely, if you do what they do, you're going to end up with the same kind of results, the same kind of life in the end. Now, there are some exceptions. You can try to follow Bill Gates all you want, but you're probably not going to, that's probably going to happen. <laughs> I mean, you go to, go to Harvard and drop out of Harvard, but come up with a good idea just before you drop out of Harvard, okay? Are you with me? By and large, the majority of people, the mass of people, they're just going to reproduce things in a little small microcosm of a world that they are influenced by. And I want you to know that the king of life has stepped in right now to your life and is inviting you to come and join in with something far bigger than what, anything that you've ever been involved with before. I'm, I want to just make note of this. On April 2nd, one of our dear friends from China, who is one of the foremost uh, leaders of the House Church of China, who will be here for one night only on April 2nd uh, on a Wednesday night, uh, he will be in a baseball cap and glass and sunglasses, not because that's what he thinks is cool uh, to wear in the pulpit, but because he pretty much has to keep his appearance hidden uh, for, for uh, a number of obvious reasons. But there's a lot of things happening in the People's Republic of China. In the People's Republic of China right now, there is a, an unbelievable number of Holy Ghost filled Christians. It's really more than anybody can actually count. The estimation is, is, is just mind boggling that there could be so many people who are numbered as the saints of the Lord Jesus Christ and it's growing every day. The last statistics was that there was more than a million people coming into the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ on a monthly basis in China where there are not churches on every street corner. And they're coming into the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ where there is actually signs and wonders and miracles and evidence that there are those things that Jesus said would be among those who believe in him and have called upon his name. 
And I, you know, it's sad that we don't see that happening as much in the United States of America, but I believe it's going to happen again. I believe God in his grace and his mercy is going to shake this nation once again. He's going to move with a mighty wind of his presence and things are going to turn around. People aren't going to be stuck in a Christian religion. They're going to come to know the personal relation, a personal relationship with the living God whose name is Jesus. Hallelujah. And you know, and we, you know, some of you, I saw some of you worshiping as we just sang that, basically just sang one song here this morning. In fact, you could just sing one song for the rest of your life. And if you know how to sing it right, it'll do you well. In fact, it'll cause you to get rapture right over into the realms of glory. Hallelujah. <laughs> God in his mercy and his grace is going to do those things that he did before. Once again, when, 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 uh, When Jonathan Edwards preached at the formation of this nation, when Evan, when, um, when Charles and, and John Wesley came here and ministered and preached, and especially George Whitfield as he ministered by the power of the living God and people like Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson were in those meetings as the power of God shook a nation and formed a nation in under a great moving of his mighty power, something we call the Great Awakening. It's in the history books. It just isn't put in your secular history books because it's nonsense to the people who are under the power and yoke of Satan who are writing those books right now. But that doesn't change nothing. It doesn't change nothing. The history's still there for everybody to go and look at. And Father's going to reproduce it no matter how many People try to say it can't happen again. No matter how many people try to say that, you know, all is lost and, you know, we now live in the, under the dominion of the influence of wicked men. Ah, no, 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 no. Christ Jesus died and rose again, ascended to the right hand of the Father to do some amazing and wonderful things so that men can come to know what it means to be alive instead of being living dead, the living dead. I think that people are fascinated with programs like that because that's who they are. That's what they are. They're the living dead. Or the dead living or whatever. The walking dead. What is it it's called? I don't even know what it's called. People are fascinated by that stuff because that's where they're at. They live in that realm. Huh? Christ Jesus said you, that, that until we come to know him, we dead while we live. And where did that death come from? The death came from the event of man's disobedience against God. Man chose. And look, you know what? We didn't really, it wasn't a process like I'm going to describe, but it really comes down to, look, I'm not going to live in your presence. I don't want to walk with you. I don't want to live with you. I'm going to seek my own. I've gotten some insight that, you know, if I do things a different way, then I'm going to have the same kind of wisdom that you have. I've got some insight. I, 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 I did a little bit of investigation. I found out that you're trying to withhold some stuff from me here. And so, you know what? I'm just, just going to have to let me, you know, find out on my own. And he found out real quickly. About the time he disobeyed God, he ran and hid in shame, suddenly suffering and despair and sorrow, gripped his heart. Fear took hold of his life. And no longer could he enjoy all this wonderful realm that God created. Father designed life. You didn't design life. Your, your favorite uh, professor did not design life. The person who wrote the science book that you ascribe to didn't design life. Huh? God designed life. He designed it. He designed it. And that's a beautiful thing now. You know, back in the, back at about the mid 90s, uh, it was actually a little close. Yeah, it was about the mid 90s, a little closer to the, to the late 90s, I think, actually. About 1997, 1998, some guys at Yale who they were not in any way pursuing any kind of investigation to validate who God is or to, si to try to side with any kind of a notion of religion. But just investigating from a statistical point of view, they started asking questions based upon all the variables that exist about our universe that we know, about the way that, that it, the earth works and the way that the uh, universe works as we understand it right now. And they asked a question in a statistical model, really 
Was this created by accident? Was a random, could this all be explained by random events? And ultimately, in the model, the model concluded, no. This was designed specifically for man because there was a series of questions asked, and you can Google this, it's anthropic theory. Right after the anthropic theory was, came out at, at Yale and was validated then by the Ivy League schools of the world as the investigation started going to higher and higher levels, I said, it, well, here's what they're going to have to do because the probability is so high that there's, it's impossible for this to have ultimately come into being without design and design specifically for man, then what they're going to have to do is come up with parallel universes. So they're going to have to say there must be several uh, million parallel universes so that statistically we could end up one with a random event having been successful. And if you're going to believe that, man, so you need to drink some more coffee. Get your brain jump started or something. You're going to buy into that nonsense. No, the reality of it is, dear people, it was designed. Every man is without excuse. And nobody going to define for you, explain to you love. You can't explain it by the interaction of echinodermis purpuralis with another echinodermis purpuralis. <laughs> which is your, according to that evolutionary model, is your nearest cousin, which is a sea urchin in the invertebrate biology. But we're not going to go into that this morning because I don't want to discuss that too long. I just know how does such a stronghold possesses our children. A stronghold possesses the mind of our high schools. And a stronghold possesses the mind of our colleges. But, you know, it, it sudden transitions begin to take place when you begin to investigate a little bit deeper, because reality of it is, you got to have a professor who has just a little bit of information who's ever going to espouse such ideologies as being factual. Much, I mean, my goodness, much less something that could be provable. You know, I, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would be willing to hear the gospel as we present it this morning and understand that there's a far more realistic alternative that can be proven to you on a daily basis and can touch you in a way that no other knowledge or information can touch you. Because if you'll hear the gospel that we preach, this good news that we declare, and you'll begin to just respond a little bit in truth and sincerity about knowing God, the power of the living God will come and touch you and change you and fill you with something more real than you've ever experienced in your life. He'll fill you with more love than you've ever felt when you begin to have some kind of romantic involvement with another person. He'll fill you with joy that no great vacation or exciting fun time has ever been able to even come close to touching. He'll fill you with peace that no security that you have ever experienced would ever be able to give you. And as soon as somebody tells me they're not running after love, joy, and peace, I know they're a verifiable idiot. <laughs> because every man's going after love, joy, and peace. And forgive me for my harsh words, but I mean, you know, that's just the way it is. I mean, men are ignorant. Men, are, men without knowledge are ignorant. It's ignorance. It's ignorance. God's come to shine the light of his love so that men might be able to understand what's going on. <laughs> men might be able to begin to see the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. You're not here today by accident. You are brought here today by the power of the living God. I don't, I don't care who persuaded you to come or who invited. The power of the living God brought you here. Father has purposed to go and ransom your soul no matter what it takes, if there's any way possible to go all the way to reach you. And so that's why someone came to you. And they, they invited you to come. And uh, I'm going to read some, some things from the Bible here off of my electronics. <laughs> and I think, you know, I was, you know, I'm, I'm being a very bad pastor right now because just the other service, I said, everybody needs to get a Bible. It's got some weight to it. <laughs> and they need to bring that. They have some weight to it and some pages that could turn. So I better, I said, some of you need to put your electronics away. And the reason I said that is because you got text messages coming in, you know, you got emails and whatnot. And, 
And, and the reality of it is, is there's enough distractions going on trying to keep you from hearing the love of God that is being screamed out in your ears every single day of your life. I mean, you could, to die without God, to live a miserable life, I mean, you've got to fight hard against the love of God and the goodness of God. Father's brought us into a relationship with Him so that we can enjoy the beauty and the splendor of His presence and not live in sickness and disease and sin and sorrow and broken relationships and all the other mess that is going on hating and being living in strife and frustrated because you can't get ahead and all the other things huh frustrated because you just basically a servant to the system I'll tell you right now unless God works a miracle for you you'll live the rest of your life a slave to the system that was designed by governmental powers if you haven't got enough insight to view that then you know come on now don't start trying to tell me about how the universe was created. Uh, don't try to tell me about the, the, the unknown things that belong to the, the value and the existence of how you came into this life. Dear people, God has purposed to cause you and I to come under his reign and under his government. You step under the government of the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have to wait till you die and go to heaven. You get to, you get to be born by the power of the Holy Ghost into heaven right now. I'm, I'm, I'm here to invite you to, uh, into an opportunity that has been made possible for us by the Lord Jesus Christ to be born into the kingdom of God right here, right now, today, to begin to live a whole new life, one that is an abundant life, one that is filled with every day living and enjoying the presence of the living God. Being, in, being kept by the power of God so you don't have to live a life of joy and suffering, sadness and badness. You get to live a life of, of, of joy and gladness. Huh? Instead of suffering and sadness. Which one do you want? Joy and gladness or suffering and sadness? People go reaching out, trying to find different things within the context of their life to, to have joy and gladness and it just kind of, it looks like it's going to be joy and gladness at first and the things start playing with it boom blows up in your face and then what a mess we have right you burned again somebody say you don't know what i've been through you don't know the stuff i've been through hey listen i knew somebody who was condemned to be as a blasphemer he then was put to death with criminals after which he was Declared to be a deceiver and regarded as one accursed. But after that he rose from the dead, he came to rescue and save those that had treated him that way. That's about the best man could do. Have you ever, have you ever been every day haunted and harassed by men around you that you love so much and all they're doing is calling you a blasphemer when you come to set them free from their sickness and disease? Jesus said it like this. They said, who is this, this forgiving sin? Jesus said, what is it easier to do? You forgive sin. He's basically saying this. You forgive sin on, on, once a year at Yom Kippur. You forgive sin. You say to everybody, your sins are forgiven. What is it easier for me to say your sins are forgiven to this man right now, even though it's not Yom Kippur? Is it easier for me to say your sins be forgiven or to say to him, take up your bed and walk? Because he's a paraplegic. Now everybody's standing there going, woo. Huh? We know what's easier to do. Say your sins are forgiven because who can heal this man who is, who is a cripple? He can't move. He's strapped down to a bed. He can't move. Jesus said, so that you may know that I'm the one who has power to forgive sin. He said to the man, rise up and walk. Somebody said, oh, that, isn't, that was written a long time ago. How do you know it's true? I know it's true because it happens right now today. It's reproducible. It's reproducible. It happens over and over again right now today. Yeah. Now, I know in many churches it's hard to, God, God to do anything because many churches could be regarded as Nazareth. In Nazareth, Jesus could not do many mighty works because of their doubt and because of their unbelief. But that doesn't change anything. There's still miracles happening, happening in this place on a continual basis. <laughs> it's true. I don't see the people here this morning, but there was a baby born blind in here. The Lord Jesus touched the baby. The baby's eyes opened. Baby born blind. Stuff that still happens. It says, so, so the people of the days of Jesus, how can anybody who was born blind have their eyes uh, 
uh, their sight restored unto them by a person who's not of God. They're just, it's just the common people trying to act, you're trying to argue with the Pharisees and the leaders, the smart people. Smart people didn't know. I mean, one of their things was, well, what, who of the rulers, which ones of the rulers and which one of the, of the, of the, of the Pharisees of the people who really know have believed upon him? Try to use that as some kind of, of credible argument for why people shouldn't believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ when he's going everywhere doing good, healing all that are oppressed with the devil, saying, I'll prove to you that you live in a prison because I'm going to set you free right now. And as soon as I do, you're going to breathe in your first breath of life. Even though you, you know, 50 years old, you're going to breathe in your first breath of life as soon as I set you free from the prison that you're in. Jesus came, and I'm going to start off with the prophets but here in just a minute, but Jesus came for the sole purpose of destroying the powers of darkness that held men as prisoners. You are held. You are held. If you do not know Jesus Christ right now, you are a spiritual prisoner to a ruthless tyrant who rules over you with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life who rules over you with sin and sickness and sorrow and, 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 uh, and every, everything that belongs to that which is torment and oppression. Christ Jesus came to set us free. And when you can, and I'm telling you right now, when somebody says to you, listen, I'm going to give you an opportunity to step into real joy, wonderful joy, joy unspeakable and full of glory, how can you just roll your eyes and say, it ain't so? When you haven't even given an opportunity. That's another level of ignorance, once again. Do you want to hear you give an opportunity to have something that, that is absolutely definable, that is, that is more real than what you see and more real than what you can ever imagine, more real than what your, your, your normal, everyday senses that you rely on for so much, you know, leadership and guidance, like your sight and your, your hearing. And, of course, a lot of people don't do a whole lot with that sensory power anyways. I mean, what, where, what is the level of most people's perception of the world around them? It's not very good. People, God's telling you right now, he's listening, he's inviting you to step out of the realm of what you can understand and what you can know and come and sit at the table with him and let him show you the beauty and the splendor of the life that he made for you. And so he invites us to come out of the darkness, out of the prison of death, out of the prison of sorrow, into a life of love and joy and peace that is truly definable, that is truly an experience that you have that is as real, more real than anything else that you've ever experienced. And so... You have plenty of proofs and plenty of evidence as soon as you call upon the name of the Lord in a sincere heart. I think that some people, it's just like, you know, they have to wait until great devastation takes hold of them. And then in the moment of great devastation, they're willing to lift up their voice and call upon the name of the Lord Jesus. And it's amazing that he's willing to He's willing to respond. As he doesn't say, oh, now, yeah, now you want me when you really need me really bad. and I Forget about it. No, he's going to take whatever he gets because he's love. He's just full of love. God is love. And, 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 and he brings us into a place of, develop, of, of dwelling in his love. He's made a way for us to step into his love. But when you step into his love, into his, into his life, why would you, you know, people say, oh, well, you know, we can just do whatever it is we want to do because my God knows that, hey, sin is more pleasurable than anything else that's going on in life or whatever. I don't know what people's excuses are for, reason, for one reason or the other. You know, supposedly people come to know the living God and then they still want to live in the camp of the devil. They still want to live in sin. Man, when you step into this relationship with the Lord, it's a beautiful and wonderful life. You don't want to go back to the garbage can. You don't want to go back to the jail cell. I'll just lock me back in there. I want some more, some more time in the, in the, in, you know, with the rats and the, and the roaches or whatever is going on in the prison spiritually, if you would. The torment and the suffering and the sorrow and the sickness and the disease. And the, and the broken relationships. Over and over again, broken relationships. The world of man is defined continually by broken relationships. Very few people have today the relationships they had five years ago. Just think about it. That's just a normal everyday friendship context. I want to read some Bible to you. I want to set you free. I want to bring you up out of the prison that you've been in. 
I'm going to start off right over here in Isaiah chapter 53 in verse 12. And I want, you, I want you to hear what Jesus did for you when he went to the cross and died for you. Jesus went to the cross and died for you. He took your sins and all the shame and all the suffering and all the reproach upon himself so that you and I could go free. He stood in our place. And verse 12 says, in Isaiah chapter, uh, Isaiah chapter 53, in verse 12, the scripture says, Therefore, he says, I will divide a portion with the great and shall divide the spoil with the strong because he hath, he hath poured out his soul. Speaking of Jesus, he has poured out his soul unto death he was numbered with the transgressors, transgressors. He bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressor, transgressors. Now go to Isaiah chapter 49. I want you to look at this verse of scripture with me here. Verse 24. The scripture says, shall the prey be taken from the mighty? Or the lawful captives delivered? But thus says the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away. And the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. For I will contend with him that contends with thee. And I will save you children. I want to read Another verse of scripture. I'm going to read about four or five verses of scripture to you. Then I'm going to talk to you about them, okay? Psalms, go just turn with me to Psalms chapter 68. Not a lot of people have Bibles. You know, we're happy, happy to give you a Bible. Because how can you know about something you've never read about? You've never investigated. And this is the, op this is the most important subject Listen, this is the most important subject that has to do with your life. People say that the Bible is the most published Bible. I guarantee you it's the least read. Everybody thinks that they know it. Somebody says, well, you know, I can't understand it. Well, get first grade education or elementary school education. Then you can understand it just fine. You with me? I don't understand it. What, what is it that you don't understand? What, you can't read? You know, that, are you with me? You can read. They give me that. It's a nonsense. It's just nonsense. Oh, I get a headache when I read the Bible. You need to get delivered. <laughs> just keep reading the Bible. That headache will go away for good. All these other excuses just go on. Oh, yeah, I read the Bible once. Oh, yeah? Well, when you, when you, when you, oh, yeah? Yeah, you read the Bible once. When? I don't even, most time when people tell me that, I don't believe that. I just want to say you a liar. You never read the whole Bible one time. And uh, because if you had, you'd read it again. I don't believe you can get through the whole Bible one time without being powerfully affected by it. Uh, it's true now. And then besides that, what, whatever, what assignment did you have in school that you read one time then took the test? And then let me ask you this. If you did that, what kind of grade did you make? Okay. Now, let's back up and reinvestigate what it is you should be doing with the Bible that you've been given. In Jesus' name, be set free. From all of your excuses right now. Isaiah chapter 68. Psalm, uh, Psalm 68. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm not drunk as you suppose. <laughs> but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Uh, Lori, Han, Lori Han took a, uh, um, a, uh, one of the YouTubes that was put on the internet the other day and she, she, she put a caption under it. This man is not drunk as you suppose. <laughs> and I thought I was actually doing pretty good. I thought I was, I didn't think I was that noticeable. <clears throat> but it's true. <laughs> Psalm 68, verse 18. The scripture says, thus, speaking of Christ Jesus, or speaking of the Messiah, thus has, thus has, forgive me, thou hast, uh, thou hast ascended on high, you have led captivity captive. You have given gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. And then I want to go over here to Ephesians chapter 4. I want you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4 and listen to Paul quote that verse of Scripture. In fact, 
the, those verses of scripture that I just read, with the exception of Isaiah 49, you can actually go read them almost word for word in the New Testament because they're just talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And Ephesians chapter 4, right here in um, verse 9, verse 8, verse 7. <laughs> just finding a place where we can break in here. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he said when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive. And he gave gifts unto men. Now he that has ascended, what is it? But first he went and descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same that ascended up above. Far above all heavens that he might fill all things. Now I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 20. I believe it's Luke chapter 22. Just go there with me. Luke chapter 23. The rustling of the pages. Luke chapter 23. And it's uh, verse I have to start reading in verse 32. Pretty much everybody in the United States of America knows the story. I don't think that any, I would, I, I believe it would be very difficult to find anybody in the United States of America in the Western world who hasn't celebrated Christmas. And they know it's more than just about Santa Claus. Even if you're a little Muslim child or a Jewish child, you know it's more than about Santa Claus. You know about, it, it's about this, this person named Jesus, this baby that was born in Bethlehem, this wonderful announcement of peace on earth, goodwill towards men, for unto you is born this day in the house of David, Christ the Savior. Everybody understands that the gifts that they give to one another has something to do with this wonderful gift that God gave to us. We're about, we're about to turn the corner here next month and we're going to celebrate something that, that most everybody in the Western world is very familiar with. They call it Easter. I call it Resurrection Sunday. And they know it's more, a lot more about than just than, than marshmallow rabbits <laughs> and colored eggs. They know, that, they know that it's something more, far, far more than that. They know that it is about when the, the one whose name is Jesus rose up from the dead after that he was crucified for our sins. Who doesn't know that? Most everybody knows that. I, I think that most everybody in the Western world, it would be very difficult to find anyone that doesn't know about Christmas and Easter. Give me a break. Somehow the blindness of heart and mind has held men prisoner. But God has said, I will come and I will, do, I will take you away from those who are mightier than you. I will deliver you from the prison that you are in. Even though you were lawfully taken captive by them, I'm still going to come and rescue you. Adam was lawfully taken prisoner by Satan because he pursued sin and iniquity. You were lawfully, even though you, even though you were born in sin, you were lawfully taken prisoner by Satan because you also committed sin and iniquity. But Christ Jesus, when he went to the cross of Calvary, he went there to destroy the principalities and the powers of wickedness. He went there to destroy the power of sin and death. He went there to liberate men from the prison that they lived in all their life. And that's why he comes and he says to us, he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to declare the good news to the poor. Not, maybe not many mighty people have believed. Maybe not many noble people, maybe not many rulers have believed 
but one day they shall. And I can look back in the, I can look back into the past and I can see by the third century, by the third century, the calendar that you observe, the calendar that you observe, the the the, the very way that you count the numbers of days right now on this life was ultimately established because Christ Jesus conquered the mighty nations and kingdoms of the earth. By the third century, nations wanted to be identified as those belonging to Christ Jesus. So many of the nations on the map declared themselves to be ruled by God by the fourth and fifth century. By the 15th century, the nations, the mighty nations of the earth called themselves Christian, though very few of them ever really stepped into the benefit of relationship. Still, he, he took and spoiled the mighty. But he's gonna be, it's going to happen even on a greater level. And the nations were made his disciples. It's true. By a small group of Jewish people, who, uh, who, having after seen Jesus and heard Jesus and followed Jesus, saw him after that he rose up from the dead and then were overwhelmed by the power and the glory of heaven when the, when the goodness of God fell upon them on a day called Pentecost, a, a celebration that had gone on for more than a thousand years, but this time heaven came and raptured the soul of the common man. It wasn't just for a prophet or a priest. Now the glory of God was poured out upon all flesh. Anybody who wanted suddenly were raptured in the divine realm, no longer held in the prison, a spiritual prison called sin and darkness. To have your eyes open to realize that you live a very spiritual life right now. No matter who you are or what it is that you say you believe. And that's why you do the things you do. It's the motive behind what you feel, your appetites, your attitudes. The Lord wants to change all those appetites and those attitudes. He wants to change the atmosphere that you live in. He wants to change the environment that you live in so that you can live every day to its full so that you can continually enjoy the presence of the living God so that he can come and teach you the ways of life because you've been taught the ways of death you've been taught the ways of strife of hatred of broken relationship of always talking bad about someone else, got something bad to say about somebody else, got an abuse. Some, what men do and call pleasure is actually a destruction and abuse to someone else. From every form of lust that you can name, somebody's getting abused. Satan has taken the most beautiful, most wonderful thing that God has entrusted to man, the power to reproduce life that never existed and that will before and will exist forever and use that as a means by which he destroys people. And that's how people have their pleasurable time. In reality, something gets killed or destroyed from it one way or the other either through abortion or having to live a life without a mommy or without a daddy. I mean, because that's the way it comes down. Or to be cared for by somebody else. From the abortions to the orphans to the children living under abuse in a household because they're a continual reminder of something terrible, bad that happened in their life. And so that child suffers for it every day. Huh? That's about the height of men's pleasure and the fruit of men's pleasure. In this world. Father's got another life for you to live. If you think that the spiritual life that you're living is not evil and having evil consequences, I challenge you to look again. If you think that the spiritual life that men are uh, men on this planet right now that govern this world right now is not evil, I challenge you to look again. And I tell you that Christ Jesus suffered, bled, and died to liberate us from such a terrible life, to liberate us from such a spiritual condition, to bring us into a heavenly realm where we can live in something that can't be found anywhere else in this love, this joy, this peace. I can't help but that there's so many sad and dis disappointed Christians. 
They've never understood how to step into this abundant life. They stopped at the door of religion and never came into the fellowship of relationship of knowing the living God. I'm telling you, just because you've seen abuses doesn't mean you throw the whole thing away. What the Word of God declares is evident today. God invites you. He doesn't invite you to come into a bunch of religion. He doesn't invite you to come into a bunch of labor and work and trying to prove yourself. He invites you to come in to his love. He invites you to come into his rest. He invites you to come on in over here to his goodness. He invites you to come and know what it means to live. Everyone who has Christ Jesus is alive. And everyone who does not have Christ Jesus is dead. That is the reality. Spiritually dead. Dead to God. Jesus said and quoted Isaiah, the prophet that I just read from. And he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. To heal the brokenhearted. To proclaim liberty to the captives. He went... He came and he led captivity captive. He, every one of us who were prisoners to sin, every one of us who, is, who were prisoners to an eternal death, a life without God, both here and forever. We were prisoners and he came and he, and he took a hold of us that were prisoners. We were, the, we were lawfully the prisoners taken captive by the mighty. The powers of darkness that rule over men's life right now with such tyranny. And, and it seems that no one wants to observe the tyranny because they too, they too caught away in the tyranny of it all. They too caught away in, in, in the wickedness of it all because the blindness of the heart. But he comes with his love and his grace and he leads men out of that darkness and gives to us that which no man could ever earn or could ever deserve. He just did it for us. He came and he broke the stronghold of the one who was too strong for us. We didn't deserve anything, but he with every, gave us everything freely that he himself has. And people still sit outside the gate and don't come in. We want you to come to know a life that's not full of law and labor. The light that is full of love and grace. He'll take you and he'll teach you every day how to live for him. The scripture says he ever lives to make intercession for us. And I want to, he ever lives. He, his whole purpose of living is he's, God Almighty loves you so much. He's praying for you right now while I'm preaching. <laughs> well, you sit in here and you listen to the most important lecture you've ever heard in your life. When you hear the most, most important message You've ever heard in your life, Christ Jesus is praying for you. Doesn't matter what you say, no matter what you've done, no matter how you've abused him. I want to show you this here in Luke chapter 23. And there he was hung. After that, he was condemned for being a blasphemer. He was condemned for being a blasphemer. And then his sentence was to be, was death row. Now to be crucified in his rightful place in the eyes of men among the criminals, the thieves, and the murderers. And there he hung between two criminals and he was put to death. And when they were come to place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him with the criminals. One at the right hand, he put him right in the put. He was numbered with the transgressors. They put him right in the middle of the criminals. One on his right hand, one on his left. I don't think that there's anybody in America who's not seen that scene. Somehow depicted Christ on the cross. And he went there just for you. No matter how you feel about him, no matter what you say about him, no matter how you treat him, he went there solely to open up the prison door. He is the very door. He's the way out of the prison. When he gave his life, he poured out his life, as I just read. He poured out his soul. He poured out his soul unto death. He poured out every part of his being so that you and I would be able to come into this living in him. Everybody's seen the scene. 
They've seen the heel, the shape of the heel with three crosses on it. They've heard again and again about how he was crucified for us. I mean, now, I mean how many different people have, have tried to depict it on the movie screen? And the, and the radical one that, what, what was Mel Gibson? Huh? The Passion. I, who didn't hear about that? Who didn't hear about that? Everybody heard about that. By and large. How many people have seen over and over again, but never has the reality of it sunk in today? I pray in the name of Jesus that God in His mercy will, call, will work a work to where that you can't just ignore it. Or just be casual about what God did. When God became flesh, He became a holy embryo. Somebody said, I can't even imagine that. Well, can you imagine how you became an embryo? No. So now moving right along. <laughs> Unless we have some embryologists in here and then they can verify that no, nobody can understand that. You know, but we have some people that are close to em embryologists here. Reality people, we, we, gotta, we, we, we playing the guessing game that we want to get out of real quick. The light is shining into the hearts of every man to give us the knowledge of the truth. <laughs> God in his love has gone to great extent so that you do not have to live a life of hell. Hell is by definition the absence of God's presence. Therefore, when you live without his manifest presence, you live in a dimension of hell. God poured out his soul unto death so that you and I can live in his manifest presence and enjoy fellowship with him all day long. And when you do, you're not going to have another sad day. If you're sick and diseased, you're going to get over that sickness and disease real quick. It's the sin that keeps you in the death. It, it, it's the iniquity that keeps you in the bondage. It, it, is, it is the pains of death. It's the wrong choices. It's being willing to, to follow a spiritual leader that wants to destroy your soul in hell that results in the, in the poor quality of life that you might live and lead. But the will of God is for you and I to come in this abundant life. This life where the glory of heaven is flooding into us and flooding out of us. And the only way you can begin to even imagine what it's like is like rivers. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's, you, it's an abundance like rivers. It's not little trickles, not little... It's not a little garden hose stream. It's not even a fire hose blast. My goodness, it's not a creek. It's, it's not a single river. It's rivers. Yeah. Hallelujah. Go stand at Victoria Falls or go, you know, stand in some other great convergence of rivers and look at the thunderous expression of all of that water. That's the kind of life that God has made available to be in us that can then be uh, expressed through us. You know what? You may think that you're in here today and you can ignore what I'm saying. Maybe. I doubt it. Anybody even thinks that. But it's just assume that you did. Reality of it is, you done messed up. You came in here and you messed up forever. You can never shake what I'm saying. You messed up. Somebody invited you in here, you came and you listening to the sound of this life and it will have you, I'm telling you, God, the power of his word will stay on you. Hallelujah. And if you wanted to live without God in your life, too late. <laughs> too late. Too late. The word of God is on you. The Holy Ghost is going to lead you, grab a hold of you. He's not going to give you any rest till you surrender. And so you might as well surrender sooner than later. Might as well go ahead and get her done today. Instead of waiting, because it's inevitable. We, we believing the power of God will give you no rest. Huh? Sin. Sin will become something so tormentous and ugly to you. You'll be more depressed than you've ever been. You'll be more sorrowful than you've ever been. You'll be more anxious than you've ever been till you surrender over to him. Hallelujah. That's the goodness of God. That's the goodness of God that won't leave you alone, that, won't, that will open up your eyes to see the mess that you're really in. Isn't that good? Yeah. Isn't that good? Father, open up your eyes so you can see what kind of destruction you've been living under, so you can really see the prison that you've been in, so that you, you can then hear the sound of his voice. 
has come to lead you out of your prison, to set you free. Here he is. Listen, let me show you him. And, and without going into the other gospels to describe what all going, is going on, they're standing around the cross. Even the leaders are standing around the cross and they're cursing him. And they're saying every evil thing about him as they nail him to the tree. The Roman soldiers have already had their fun after having put a crown of thorns upon his head, after having mocked him and scourged him. And now the leaders of the Jews stand there ridiculing him, speaking all manner of evil against him. And look at his intercession. Look at how he feels. He says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He's there actually by, by mandate offering himself as a sacrifice for the sins of those who nailed him to the tree. He's offering himself as a sacrifice for those who are ridiculing him and scorning him because there's no other way that they can be free. There's no other way that you can step out of the spiritual blindness that you live in, the complaint the accusation, the lie, the slander, the broken relationship, all the things that go on in a spiritual world of darkness. There's no other way for you to step out of that realm and into this glorious realm of living with Him unless Christ Jesus poured out His soul unto death because in doing that, He opened the door for you and I to walk out of a life of hell into a realm of heaven. i am tell you, when you're in a black, dark cave, when you're in a place so black, dark that you can't see nothing, huh? And then all of a sudden a light shines and you step into a room lit up, you know the difference. Praise God. Huh? I'm glad that everybody can know the difference because it's just that, it's just that clear, light and darkness. When you step out of a prison of sin, when you step out of a prison of spiritual death into this wonderful realm of life, the contrast is even greater. The Lord invites you in. Oh, hallelujah. He invites you in today. He's right now. The scripture says he lives to make intercession for us. He lives to pray for us. I'll read one verse of scripture to you, one more verse of scripture to you, and then I'm going to talk to you just a little bit more. And I'm, and I'm going to talk to not only those who are in here that don't know the Lord Jesus, but those of you who called upon the name of the Lord, but you've never really understood how to live every day filled with His joy. You've never understood how to recognize the voices of the spiritual power of darkness that once ruled your life that still comes back to claim you and influence you. I want to help you today. Christ Jesus is here to help you so that you can live completely free from those who once held you under their authority and still would like to come back to claim your soul. Romans 8, 32. I want to read this to you. God, verse 32, you there? I'll give you a moment to get there. You there? Because this is the only way your life is ever going to change. Just to begin to believe this love that God has for you. Because I'm telling you right now, when you believe that God is who He is, says He is, and then you begin to comprehend and understand how much He loves you and how devoted He is to you, you're going to be, you're going to be one happy camper. <laughs> you're going to be one happy person walking through this life every day. You know, you, you're, you're going to, your heart's going to be raptured by a relationship that, that the, the relationship, as I started off talking about, between you as a man and another woman or a woman and another man can't even begin to compare to you. A relationship that's far more real, far more wonderful, far more captivating. And when you begin to understand this beautiful realm, suddenly you find the ability and the power and the strength to say no to everything that belongs to that other realm. And Father in His mercy and His grace is so patient to teach us it doesn't matter how much you go through, how much failure you go through, how much sin, how much rebellion, disobedience. He gives gifts to the rebellious also. 
He he ransomed the rebellious. He he set those who were lawfully taken prisoner by Satan. He set them free and has devoted himself to pray. Just like he's saying, Father, forgive them. He's now entered into the heavenly realm and stands before the Father night and day saying, Lord, forgive them. Make an intercession. As long as you don't quit, Father's not going to quit. As long as you don't walk away, he's not going to walk away. As long as you don't give up, he's not going to give up. You will not father, you will not find father walking away from the relationship with you. You will not find the Holy Spirit walking out on you, slamming the door, saying it's done. It's over. I'm tired of it. Because of what Christ Jesus did for us at Calvary. Because what he did for us when he raised up from the dead, when he spoiled principalities and powers. When he rose up from the dead, he stripped Satan of all that he had rights to. Scripture said, he through death destroyed him that had the power of death. Somebody said, How did Jesus, why did Jesus have to die? Because it was through his death that he destroyed Satan's power of death over us and reign and influence over us. He's an amazing God. He loves us so much. That's why John said, John is the most radical preacher against sin being in the life of the believer. But he says, if you sin. I write these things unto you that you do not sin, that you never sin. But if you sin, we have an intercessor. 1 John 2, 1. Christ Jesus, the righteous. What is he doing? He's there. He's standing for us. He's fighting on our behalf. Every time Satan tries to come and claim us, we cry out for help. And he's a savior that comes and saves us and brings us back unto himself and then destroys every claim of sin and every claim of death that otherwise would be held against us. Ask a Hindu. If a Hindu sins, he has to spend 53,000 life cycles as either an insect, insect or a lower, lower creature. What can a Hindu do for his sin? Ask any guru. No one can tell you what you can do for your sin other than 53,000 life cycles. Hey? Christ Jesus come to wash it away. I think that's why people in Nepal and India come running to Jesus. There is a means by which my sin may be washed away. Then they come to this one who will wash their sins away and they get more than they bargained for. Suddenly they're filled with joy. Suddenly they're filled with peace. Suddenly they're filled with this love, this glory. Suddenly their sicknesses and their disease are cured and healed if there's a preacher there with the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Praise God. Today you're going to get more than you bargained for. You call upon the name of the Lord. Should you just want to be, should you just want to be cleansed from your sin? Should you just want to be able to know that you're right with God and call upon the name of the one who loved you so much? There's no other story of any other person who died for your sin and rose again that you might live in the presence of God both now and throughout forever. That's the life of God that has been freely given. God's life for you. Don't halt between two decisions or between two opinions any longer because it's a, it's a great place to compromise. You, can name it, you, can need, you cannot have the goodness of the life that God has freely given. You only just experience continual ongoing shame. Jesus didn't die at Calvary's cross and raised the third day so that you can live a life feeling guilty. Ha. <laughs> He didn't die on the cross and raise the third day. See, you can live a life trying to prove yourself to earn something from God. <laughs> Jesus died at Calvary's cross and rose from the th grave the third day so that you can be accepted by the beloved. So that you can be acceptable unto the living God. So God would come and make his dwelling with you and come and, and now teach you every good thing that belongs to the life that he's freely given. No, could you hear the grace of God that has appeared to all men? Huh? Could you see he's come to teach us how to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. He's not going to stop. He's not going to give up on us. He'll train us. He'll lead us in the way. He's our provider. Making all provision for us. He's a protector who keeps us by the power of God. He's a perfecter. Huh? That will establish every good thing in your life.
Now, if you want every bad thing established in your life, just keep going the way you're going. But if you want every good thing established in your life, then come unto Him. Come unto Him. All you that are weary and heavy laden, all you that are worn out, all of you that just are frustrated because you can't find the way. Yeah, I, I tell you right now, if you had enough time, if you had enough time, if you had enough time, you would discover that everything in the Bible is true, but you don't have that much time. You'd discover it by experience. But you don't have that much time. The more science that investigates, the more truth that they will discover. But you don't have enough time till they find all the truth because you've made them your leaders or your gods or those who bring to you the truth of what life's all about. Eventually, they'd come to discover all these things about the life that God has given. The power behind the raindrop. Amen. The clouds that are formed, the sun that rises, hallelujah, the moon that orbits around the earth, reflecting the glory of the sun to give us light at night, for tides and for seasons and all the things that go in that beautiful design of life that Father came up with and established. I'm going to try to finish here. I've got so many more things to say. I've left so many things out. <laughs> Romans chapter 8. God who spared not his own son. <laughs> Hallelujah. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son for me so that I might believe and have life everlasting both now and throughout the ages to come God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes that's you right now an opportunity for you whosoever believes you would not have to perish not to have, your life would not have to come to a continual ongoing destruction. One problem after another problem, one sorrow after another sorrow, one disappointment after another disappointment. What a terrible life to be constantly being disappointed, to be constantly overwhelmed with circumstances and situations of life because things aren't working out. Dear people, let me just give you some news right now. Let me give you a flash news report. Nothing's ever going to work out for you. Oh, but please give me hope. No, in a world that is bent on destruction, nothing's going to work out for you. It ain't going to work out. Christ Jesus worked it out so that you now can come on in to where it really works, where it's good every day. <laughs> Hallelujah. We were in, we were in uh, Halls Creek, which is in the pits and jaras of the outback of Australia, way out near the Painted Desert, way out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, nothing. And a bunch of people, a bunch of Aborigines came from, from so, so far, far distances. Some of my things as far as 2,500 kilometers away. And it was so beautiful to see these Aborigines this one woman stands out to me. She had no shoes, and she didn't want any. She had an old raggedy dress on, and it was, she didn't even know anything about it. She was just standing there praising the Lord, saying, God's doing great things, great things, great things he's done for me. Talking about all the glorious realms of heaven that she was living in. Huh? She wasn't in the realm of disappointment anymore. She was in another value system. She was already in another value system before she ever came into the kingdom. When she came into the kingdom, everything got good. Walk about wasn't the way to get about, get about anymore. Walk about wasn't the way to live anymore. Walk about didn't bring any kind of peace anymore. She lived in the peace. She didn't need to walk about anymore. It was just something cultural to them. What are you going to do with your life? Are you going to walk about, meandering about, 
looking for one answer, one hope after another, only to find yourself continually disappointed. That didn't work out. This didn't work out. I feel terrible. What have I done with my life? Did you give your life to Jesus? If you gave your life to Jesus, you've done everything you need to do with your life. Huh? Why didn't you, why would then you put your identity and worth on some kind of a career? Why would you put your identity and worth into what, how much of a bank account you have? Huh? Well, how, why would you measure your, the value of your life and the worth of your life based upon material possessions and, and what you would define as success within that realm? Don't do that. Come up here. Look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Look unto this realm of heaven that now has been made available to you by the presence and working of the Holy Ghost. Because he's, he's establishing everything that is good in your life. He's teaching you how to enjoy the presence of God and hate the absence of it. Amen. Huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me say that again. He's <laughs> teaching you how to enjoy the presence of God and hate the absence of it. Amen. He's teaching you that every evil thing is truly evil and you don't want it in your life, and that every good thing is truly good, and that every good thing only comes by the one who loves us so much, God, who spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Thank you, Lord Jesus. I'm going to read one more verse of Scripture, and then I'm going to be done. I promise. I promise. I, I promise. This is, the, this is it. Hebrews chapter 7. And I believe it's, I believe it's verse 26. 25. <laughs> Hallelujah. I just want to make sure that everybody's truly ruined. <laughs> ruined for the world. Ruin so that you don't fit in Satan's scheme no more. That's what I'm talking about, ruin. Huh? Ruined so that this world is crucified to you and you crucified to it. Ruined. Huh? Can't find pleasure no more outside of Christ Jesus. Ruined. Amen. Hebrews 7, 25. Hallelujah. Speaking of Jesus, priesthood says... Therefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him because he forever lives to make intercession for us, to intercede. I brought guilty before the court. Everybody on the jury panel, everybody in the courtroom has evidence and proof that I am guilty and every one of them as it were, wants me to be destroyed. And suddenly an intercessor comes into the room and says, it's not so. I have the evidence and I have the proof. All these charges are made void, void they removed. They do not apply. Jesus, who's at the right hand of the Father, Hallelujah. Beckons you come. Beckons you to live in that wonderful truth and reality. You'll never have another bad day. You'll find a relationship with him that you do not want to do anything that's not pleasing unto him. And if you do, he's there loving you and teaching you how to live right. I want you to stand with me. He's loving you and teaching you how to live right. He's loving you. I said he's loving you and teaching you how to live right. We've wrestled for some of your souls here this morning. But though we may have wrestled spiritually for some of your souls, we've done nothing compared to what Christ Jesus did, for he died for you. And it had been a terrible thing and a non-meaningful thing had he died for you and just died. Because if he had died and just died, it'd have no relevance to your life today. But he died and rose again and he lives. And that's why what he did at, at the cross of Calvary means something to you right now. Because he's here right now and he's calling you to come. 
He's, he's here right now and he beckons you to put your trust in him. He, he's calling you right now and he says every good thing that he has is yours. He's telling us that Father freely gives us all things to enjoy. Everything now freely gives us all things because of what he did for us. I want you to respond to Jesus right now. I don't care who you are, where you're at, whether you're standing here in this building today, or you're watching on the web, or you're viewing this on YouTube. Christ Jesus, the living God, who's proven to be the living God. We've not followed cunning fables that were devised or created by men. But we are eyewitnesses of His glory and of His majesty. We have, made, we have been made partakers of His divine nature and experienced His glory and the results of His presence in our life. And we stand among the hundreds of thousands and the hundreds of millions right now who experience the same and God's calling you. It doesn't matter what you've done. You could have blasphemed them. You could have said every evil thing about them. You could have been one of those who crucified them and nailed them to the tree and was who, one who brought a, a false witness and testimony against them that condemned them, condemned them and still he would be interceding for you and saying, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. And all you have to say is, yes, yeah, so God forgive me. And forgiveness is there. And Father does something so wonderful because He removes in His presence, He removes all the sin and all the wrongdoing away so that it's not ever remembered. It's not like a friend who continues to be a friend but remembers the bad thing that you did against them when you violated some trust of the relationship. But he's a friend that forgets it, can't remember, has no part of the relationship. There's no story like this told among men. And if it were a story, it would be beautiful. But it's a living gospel. It's the truth. It's, it's what's really going on right now. Father wants to purify your conscience now. From dead works, he wants to purify your conscience from the guilt. He wants to purify your conscience from the shame. He wants you to come in and boldly now live to be and live out all those things that He's freely given and live to be all that Father has purposed you to, to be. Hallelujah. You can come right there where you're standing. Just come with your heart. <laughs> Just come with your heart right now in Jesus' name. Today, if you were sick in your body and you had a terminal disease and the doctor says that you're going to die in the next month or two and I said to you, I'll lay hands on you and that terminal disease would go. Most people within the framework of what they understand about life would immediately respond and say, well, lay your hands on me because I don't want this terrible disease to destroy me. And we believe and know that God would, he, would do that right now. And it's not just an example of what I want to say because He's the one who has come to heal sickness and disease. But more importantly, I'm saying that without Christ Jesus, you have a spiritual disease that's terminal and it will destroy you eternally in hell. And that we can lay hands on you and you'll go free from the power of that sin and the power of that shame. God says all you have to do is confess your sins. Call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what is going to happen? He's going to come and change your heart. You're going to have a different heart about the way that you live your life. You're going to want to live for Him. You want to live for that which He's freely given. The life that only God has to give. What will you do with Jesus today? I pray in Jesus' name you'll turn your heart towards Him.
If there's anybody here right now, you want to accept Christ Jesus as your Savior. You want to make a call for Him to come. Right now, you have the opportunity. He will answer you. You can either call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ where you're standing right now or you can come up here and I'd be happy to lay hands on you and pray for you and see every claim of Satan, every claim of sickness and disease, every claim of, of, of spiritual bondage broken from off of you. But whatever you do, don't refuse this life that He's freely given. Don't refuse this opportunity of living in heaven. Now, right now. Not just when you die. Right now. Living in heaven. Right now. Right now. Right now. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's up to you. It's up to you. I know how God feels about you. How do you feel about Him? I know what Christ Jesus feels about you. How do you feel about Him? Will you respond to Him right now with your heart? Will you respond to the living God? He loves you so much. He's your only escape. He's your only escape. From the death, from the sorrow, from the pain, from the disappointment. He's your only escape. He's calling you. He says, come. Come unto me. And I'll give you rest. That's what Jesus says. Come to me. I'll change everything. I'll make everything new. That's his promise. Everything. Not some things. Everything. 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 Somebody said, well, I called upon the name of the Lord and everything didn't change. Well, you didn't call upon the name of the Lord in the faith realm that I'm describing because I'm telling you what God said in His Word. I'm not telling you what men say in their religion. I'm telling you what God says in His Word. So today, we want you to understand, no matter who you are, maybe you, maybe you backslid, maybe you become cold and indifferent towards God. He's calling you to come. And enjoy the beauty of His presence. The glory of relationship with Him. What will you do with Jesus? What will you do with Jesus today? What will you do with Jesus? I want everybody to bow your heads with me. Right now in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I break the stronghold and the power of every mind-blinding spirit. Satan, I demand you, release your claim off the souls of men in this place. In Jesus' name, I take the blood of Christ Jesus and I place it upon every life here. And I command in Jesus' name that every soul respond to the power and the authority of that name. I set you free from your prison. I set you free from a lifestyle that is contrary to the ways of God. From this day forward, forward to forever live for Him. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> so in the mighty name of Jesus, go free. In the mighty name of Jesus, I proclaim liberty to you from this day forward. From now on, now you live for God and not for yourself. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Thank you, living God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Blessed is your name, Lord. Blessed is your name, Lord. Gina, come here. You got something you want to say? Come over here. We just thank you, Lord. Um, 
The most beautiful ceremony that we ever get to witness is a wedding ceremony. And I just saw Jesus down here at the altar next to Pastor. And there are souls here today that he's, he's standing here patiently waiting, just as the, as the groom waits. He's waiting for his bride. He's waiting for his bride. Some of those of you here today need to renew your vows to him because you've walked away because he's been faithful and he's not left. He's, he's not wanted to get a divorce. He's waited and he knew you would come back and he's asking you to come back today with your whole heart. And there's no coincidence that every single church function of church ceremony we come to looks like a wedding ceremony. Every Sunday, every Wednesday, every Saturday, every day that you come, there's a center aisle. And Jesus is here waiting. He, he waits every single Sunday for you to come. And the moment that you step out of your seat down that aisle, he begins to clothe you, clothe you in righteousness and put a white garment on you. And it's his righteousness that he wants to give you. And so if you've not asked Jesus to be your everything, which is what every bride does when she comes down the aisle and she says, here I am, I'll be everything you want me to be. He's asking you just to come. There's a wedding ceremony that wants to take place today. And this is your family, that we're here as witnesses. There is no better family than the Abiding Place family. I've seen that over and over again and we'll stand beside you will walk with you in this journey with you and your husband, but he's calling you. You have to be the one. You can say it in your heart, but there is something dramatic that changes when you decide you're gonna be brave enough to walk down the aisle and renew your commitment or make your vows to him today. Don't wait. It's the most glorious day of your life, and he's standing here waiting with pastor to come and to bring you into a new life that you can't ever begin to imagine, to take you on a honeymoon that never ends, that keeps getting better and better and better. It's true. It's true. Go ahead, David, sing, let's sing that song just for a little bit here. Just sing the song with us. And let Christ Jesus take over your life. If you want prayer for anything, if you're sick in your body, you have problems in your life, addictions, whatever may be going on, you want to give Christ Jesus your life today. You want us to pray with you and for you. We're here to pray with you and for you. We want you to come right now. Just come right now. We also invite you to come and worship the Lord with your tithes and with your offering because it's a very big part of worship. It's a part of our yieldedness to Him where we just... We just surrender our hearts over to Him. It's not just a ritual of, of raising finances. It's an opportunity to come worship. So come worship. Those of you who, who know how to worship with your tithes and know how to worship with your offering, you come do that now. 
Those of you who want us to pray with you and for you, for any reason, we want you to come right now. We invite you to come right now. We promise you the power of God is here. The living God will touch you. He will change you. There's no reason for you to be without when God has supplied everything. There, I'll say it again. There's no reason for you to be without when God has supplied everything. There's no reason for you to be without anything when God has supplied everything.